Welcome to Fight Zone. The blood, the sweat, the tears, the sweet taste of victory. Join the revolution. How do you keep fucking tell me to stop? Welcome back to the Bad Blue Podcast, people. This is number 32. Didn't ever think we'll get this far, but we've got a special guest on today. Um, before I release the name and before we give you the pleasure of speaking to the guy, we're going to obviously rifle off the sponsors as normal. Uh, Looking Sharp Barbers, Tannen Salon. Uh, if you're a local listener, a local watcher, head over there. You, you know the drill. They're the best in the business. They've also got a little uh, beauty beauty room looking fab. Get across over there and go and look dapper. Also, Scott West Shellfish. They are, oh, got me words mixed up there. Uh, they are the best in the business up in Scotland and they're doing overseas stuff now. Uh, for all your fishery needs, go over to their website and their Facebook page. Honestly, they couldn't be run by better people as well, top class people. Uh, Mr. Bloom's Black Seed Oil Mechanics, you know the drill with them. Their, taste, their products are absolutely brilliant, taste beautiful, and also got many health benefits. So check their Facebook, uh, Facebook page out. And also they've got a YouTube channel as well now, so head over there. Mr. Bloom's Black Seed Oil Mechanics. And as always, Spartan BK Fight Club, pit fighting organization, the number one in the world, Fight Fest coming up in two uh, 10 days now, I believe, nine days. So, yeah, go check their channel out as well. Facebook page, TikTok, Instagram, head over there and check them out. Honestly, that is some ferocious fights on there. You will not be disappointed. Right, today, Seamus <coughs> Devlin, a man who has been in the game for some time and the rewards are starting to pay off now. How are you, my man? I'm good, my man. How are you, Lee? I'm good. How, Seamus, how have you dealt with all this, man? Like, it's did, did this all come as a surprise to you? Or did you know this time was finally going to come? Like, what, obviously, the <laughs> pandemic, people have... some. Let's be honest, some people have went downhill, some people have flourished in it. You, my friend, have flourished in it. Your profile has risen massively. They're starting to happen, man. Starting to happen. Yes, mate, yeah. I think, um, to be honest with you, mate, it's all about perceptions. It's all about perceptions. Every time something negative comes my way, uh, a negative hurdle, I always like to flip that perception. I like to jump that hurdle. So when COVID hit and the circumstances, the current climate had everybody really, they couldn't really do much. In terms of being an unlicensed fighter and a bare knuckle fighter, there was nothing really there. Everyone was on the back burner for a good 12 to 18 months. And that helped me, to be honest with you, mate, um, because... I knew, I just knew that it was now or never. I just knew. And there was no better time with the current situation, the current climate, there was no better time to just hone my skills, go off the radar and, and give it my all, give it my focus. Tunnel vision, 100%. I think it was two or three years ago that I actually started to think about the pro game. Uh, I was training in a place called Larches, ABC and Savick. Uh, they've got good amateurs and pros at that gym. That's located in Preston. And um, there was a coach there, an ex-professional called Paul Morris. And um, he said to me, have you ever thought about going professional? And me at the time, and I'm a modest individual anyway, Lee, but me at the time, I said, um, I don't think I'm really good enough. And he said, you are. You are good enough. You've got the style for it. So over the months, I started giving it a bit of serious thought. And then I kind of just fell back into the bare knuckle and unlicensed scene. Um, and yeah, and I kind of put it, I kind of went to the back of my mind. And it was only till I started to feel myself as well become a competent boxer and I had the fundamentals down to a T that I was actually good enough to do it. And then, like I say, with the circumstances that arose with COVID and everything, um, it just gave me that extra little push. I got a bee in my bonnet and I went for it. How was it growing up in your town? Was it when back in the day when you were just obviously a wee nipper? Was it was it rough to growing up? Was it was it was was it easy pickings? Was it 
Was life good? To be fair, I'm from a small I'm from a small town in Lancashire. I'm from Paddyham, Lancashire. People might be more familiar with uh, Burnley, Lancashire. That's a little bit more well known. Paddyham's like a little village, a little town on the outskirts. Um, but it was a it was a normal placid upbringing. I'm not from a long line of fighters, me Lee. Um, I'm from a, I, my father was an Irish Republican. He was from Portadown in the north of Ireland. He come over here as a young boy. Um, he met my mother. I think I can't remember how old she was at the time. But um, yeah, he met my mother over here. She was from like um, a sort of a middle class upbringing in Blackpool. She was born and raised over that way. So um, yeah, they come over to Paddyham. And I was born in Burnley, raised in Paddyham. And it was quite a normal, placid upbringing, mate. There was nothing to suggest that I would have turned out to be a bare-knuckle fighter or a boxer, mate. We'll put it that way. Were you a quite hyperactive child? Were you always into sports? Do you know what, mate? I wasn't. I think it's like that me, myself and Irene syndrome. Do you know, the quiet kid that's just in the back that doesn't say much, you know, doesn't put his hand up, doesn't let his voice be heard. And I think when you get to us, it sets off a mental torture in your head that... Um, especially if you've got something more about you, if you've got the capacity in you. And I used to think to myself, well, when I get to age, I'll show everyone what I've got inside me. You know, because I was a placid, quiet kid. I was one of very reserved, mate, very, very reserved and very, very quiet. I mean, all my aunties, when they speak to me now, my relatives used to say, I can't believe that you've turned out to be a pro boxer and a bare knuckle fighter because I was such a shy kid, to be honest with you, mate. And that, that went right through to my teenage years. And then, obviously, my late teens and my um, early adolescence, that's where a lot of adversity hit. So, what were you like growing up? What were you into? What, what I was your channel your energy? I was always into sports. I loved boxing. So, it figures I absolutely loved it, mate. I used to watch uh, boxing with my dad as a kid. One of the first ever experiences of boxing was Chris Eubank uh, against Steve Collins. Wow. And I remember watching that with my father. My father was obviously rooting for Collins, being the Irishman. And I was rooting for Eubank, but I just loved it. I looked at this charismatic, enigmatic character coming out, the way he used to be, his own manner. And I just thought, you know what? I loved it. Even back then, I thought, that's a bit of me, that. Do you know what I mean? But I was just a shy child. I was one of those. I had to, I had to find myself, so to speak. I had to go through those adverse points in life before I hit that point. What can you elaborate? As in, you were a shy child, a shy teenager. Yeah, I was never, I never saw my mother's friends used to come around the house. I'd hide behind the settee when I was six years old. I was really, really shy. Um, in school, I kind of just went off the radar. So I never, you know, I had a few friends, but I was very, very quiet. Didn't say much. I only spoke when I was spoken to. Um, yeah, just very, very reserved, very reserved. How, how did that play into your teens? That kind of transcended into my teens. It was the same then. Like I say, quite an uneventful childhood. Um, I didn't really have to put up much adverse points in my life. I think what's moulded me was my adolescence, almost certainly, because um, I was shielded to a degree from a lot of stuff when I was younger. Um, but in my teen years, right through school, I think it was year nine, we moved from England to Ireland. And that was an experience for us all because going to a different country, especially the north of Ireland, where, as everyone knows, sectarianism is still quite rife in a lot of areas. And being um, four English brothers in a, in a highly Catholic area, it didn't matter if you were a Catholic yourself and you had uh, Catholic parents, it didn't go down very well. So that was an experience for us. That moulded us a little bit. We came back to England when I was 15. As I say, I was still a quiet lad. And then at 16, I found the, um, the party lifestyle and I found the recreational drugs. How, just taking you back to the Northern Ireland situation, like how yeah. did you and your brothers cope with that, you and your family? Because obviously it is, it, it's, it, it's, still, it's still very hot there, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's yeah, well, for, for a good example of that, Lee, a good example of that is, um, so we're over here in England, we're used to going to school in the morning, you walk to school with your friends, you go to your class and it's as simple as that. Over there, me and my brother would be walking to school in the morning and there's armed police with semi-automatic rifles. Uh, in the north of Ireland, in Portadown, where we stayed for six months before we moved to the Irish coast, Newcastle in Northern Ireland, beautiful place, mate, right next to the mountains of Morn, absolutely gorgeous. Before we moved there, we're in Portadown. There's still a very high military presence there. You'd see the soldiers there in the tanks. It was, it was almost like stepping into a different world altogether, mate. Really was. I, 
See, I, I know it's a touchy subject where obviously us having like our British military over there. Um, my uncle, he's served time, he, he done time over there. Um, like I say, I, I think there's some very touchy subjects and touchy points on that matter. Um, I don't say that I agree with every reason why they were over there. Um, but yeah, that's a different matter. How, how bad of a presence was it there when you? When when news were there, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. They were there, but I mean, we didn't. We we were lucky. We didn't see a lot of extreme violence, so we were lucky. Uh, but the, there was a few incidents here and there, but we never saw anything that would have um, caused me any trauma later on, so to speak. So yeah, we were kind of lucky in that respect. I think my mother and father were keen to get us out of there pretty quick. I think we were there just shy of six months, and then we moved to Newcastle. So you said you started partying and hitting the recreational drugs. Would you say that, because did the move have any effect on you? Mm, I'm, I'm not too, I wouldn't say it had any long lasting effect, to be honest. I'd say it was just an experience, you know, a new experience. Mm -hmm. I think that sometimes, well, most of the time for human beings, it's good to come out of your comfort zone because it molds your adversity, molds you. It really does. Um, Obviously, as a kid at the time, a young lad, 12, 13, I didn't see it that way because obviously your world just revolves around your friends and your hometown. But um, yeah, I would have loved to have stayed there in hindsight. But then again, if I did, who knows? It, I might not be sat here now talking to you. So for everything, a reason, my friend. How did the party life attract, like obviously attract you? Or it, it, how did it keep you? How did it? How... Uh, it just... It was, yeah, when I first ever experienced ecstasy, I think a lot of teenage lads and, and lads in the 20s can um, can also relate to it. They, they took it themselves. It's, oh, 100%. 100%. Uh, it, it was some time. I mean, the first time you ever take it is it's unbelievable. But then it starts to go down a slippery slope. So I would ask, I would say to any teenage lad now that's coming up to just stay away from the scene altogether. I implore them to because you've got to have a little bit of fun. Do you know what I mean? Life's um, stressful as it is. But, I would, I would advise any young lad out there to stay away from that party scene and cheap thrills because that's all it is, mate. It doesn't lead to anything good. Um, a lot of lads that I know that was on that scene back in the day that used to party hard, two, three day benders, they suffer with all serious depression, clinical depression. Um, there's a lot of commonalities that I see in, in that. So yeah, I would implore anybody to stay away from that sort of scene. But I ended up spiraling out of control, alcoholism. I mean, I was drinking for two, three years from the age of 17 about 20 i was drinking non-stop to the point where i was actually shitting blood you know that's how that's how serious it got uh, amphetamines that i got bad on amphetamines um cocaine everyone knows that's well documented that's well publicized um i lost everything through that drug so it might start off as a bit of fun but believe me it can soon turn sour so any kids out there now get a get a trade behind you Stay at home, educate yourselves, read substantial books, don't follow the social media trends, and just educate yourselves and just be courteous and kind, respectful and go about your business. But obviously, young lads nowadays, they don't really have that temperament. You've got to go through these things. You've got to fall to pick yourself back up and learn, haven't you? So. I, I had some very, very, very similar traits that we had there, like from even the similar, like same ages. Like you lose yourself. It's in it's easily done it's it it doesn't matter how strong your network is around you it doesn't matter how much your friends try and tell you it, it it's just a, That's a true. selfish manner it's a selfish act. Yeah. i've been yeah. there before and done that like i didn't give a flying shit about, about anybody yeah anybody like yeah. turned myself delusional with taking that much stuff i mean i'm not proud of it but Literally delusional hallucinations. There's the yeah. and you twist logic of things, don't you? It's the addict's mentality. You twist yeah. logic of things, you lose friends slowly but surely. Yeah. People are dropping off around you, yeah. and you twist logic of it. You know, it's always not. It's never your fault. It's mm -hmm. it was never my fault. You know what I mean? No. That's the that's the addict's mentality. But I think someone once said to me before something really powerful, and I'll give him a little shout out: Jimmy McCrory, bare knuckle legend and boxer. And what a top man. He's been a top bloke. And uh, I've corresponded with him over the years often. And he said to me, I said, I used to be an addict, Jimmy. And he said, no, you still are. It's how you deal with it day to day, how you fight that battle. And I win it admirably so every day. I've fallen a couple of times, 
I've fallen a couple of times. But as I'm getting older, I'm noticing as the years are going on, I'm becoming so much stronger, not just physically, but mentally, a lot wiser. I'm understanding myself, that little devil, that little voice that talks to you. We all have it. I'm learning to just reprogram that subconscious, get rid of that and turn. It's all about turning everything into a positive, transmuting negative things into something positive. And I've become pretty good at doing that. Oh, most definitely. Is this is this what made your path into boxing? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, mate. I mean, I hit rock bottom um, at twenty six. I was at the absolute bottom. That was the worst year in my life. At twenty six years old, uh, I'd lost my house. I'd lost my missus at the time. I'd lost my job. I'd lost my friends. I'd lost my family. So I'd lost everything. I was homeless for months. I was sleeping in a shed. I was creeping into my mate's shed at night time. I was sleeping on benches. Um, it was a rough, rough time, mate. A really rough time. And um, obviously going through that adversity and hitting that rock bottom, I had nothing left to lose. And I, that was just... But this is what I'll say to a lot of people as well. Hitting rock bottom is not for everybody. For me, that's what I needed. I needed to hit rock bottom. I like to think of myself as a phoenix reborn from the ashes. I needed to absolutely strip myself down, look myself in the mirror and build myself back up. Um, but yeah, I was absolutely finished, mate. I was going to jump back on a ferry and go back to Ireland. I had family members over there. I've got lots of family over in Porter Down. So I, um, I spoke to them on Facebook and I was going to go and get a ferry ticket and get back over to Ireland. But my friend at the time, a couple of weeks before I was about to do this, my friend at the time, he messaged me and said, listen, mate, I can't see you like this. I cannot see you like this. He said, come and stay at mine. I'll feed you. He turned. He actually turned. I, I, I mentioned this in another podcast. He turned his kitchen into a gym, mate. Wow. Floor to ceiling bowl, punch bag, mitts, bagged a lot, gloves. He got me everything sorted, weights. And he said, listen, mate, you train here as long as you want. Get yourself sorted. Anyway, I cut a long story short. He's um, sorted his motherboard out for his Facebook one day, for his computer, sorry. He sorted the motherboard out because his computer was broke. Uh, when he's fixed that computer and he's turned it on, the old tabs come popping up and Facebook popped up. And I said, oh, click on that, mate, and um, see if I'm still logged in. Because it used to have a, a square and it'll say, keep me logged in. So he clicked on my Facebook was on. And as he's turned it on, I've seen just the top of a profile picture. And it was uh, Sean Smith's profile picture. Uh, the UK scariest debt collector. He uh, also runs UBKB. And I seen his picture and I said to him, my mate was just about to scroll and I said, scroll back up, mate. What was that? And he scrolled back up and I seen it applying for bare knuckle fighters. And um, I applied that day and I just, boom, tunnel vision. I knew it was now or never. And I just, I put the plan into action and I haven't looked back since unflinchingly so, mate. I mean, the whole town, it's a small town, but the whole town thought I'd lost my mind. I mean, I heard the whispers that were going round. People thought I'd lost my head and completely lost it, but I never had more clarity in my life, mate. I was never thinking clearer, and the rest is history. What? How did you find it when you first went into the gym? Was it was it daunting? Were you, were you, did you know what you were getting yourself into? I'm glad you've asked me that question, Lee, because... I was talking about this two or three days ago to a friend of mine. It wasn't daunting. This is what's strange about this. I get nerves before my fights, don't get me wrong. Any fighter that tells you yeah. otherwise is lying. Um, but when it comes to the other aspects of it, getting up early in the morning, going and meeting different fights, travelling to different gyms, it never bothered me, mate. And I think that's why I knew that this was for me. Because mm -hmm. those aspects of the sport never bothered me. It was, so, like, there were certain things that maybe the normal average man gets nervous over, job interviews, whatever else. To me, that was just second nature. And, and I just knew I just knew that, you know what I mean? So, to me, it was just natural, mate. That's how I knew that I was supposed to be where I was. I just left it too late. Mm -hmm. But there's no point crying over spilt milk. It is what it is. I'm 33 now. Do you know what I mean? I've been at it nearly six years, but um, in that six years, I've made some real traction and I've picked up some uh, real momentum. So you're in the bracket as well as many other fighters, ex-fighters. Boxing truly, really has saved your life. Combat sports, fighting, the structure, the routine really has put order into your life. What has just really turned you into the disciplined guy? Is that yeah, right, fair assessment? 100%. It's an absolute spot on analysis, mate. And I say to people all the time that those things leak into other aspects of your life. Yeah. So the confidence, we touched on it when I was younger about my confidence issues and stuff like that. Boxing has strengthened my confidence to no end. 
So in other aspects of my life, in other areas, I've noticed that the way I conduct myself, the way I carry myself, the way I talk, I mean, podcasts, things such as this, media interviews, doesn't bother me at all, mate. When it's, especially when it's revolving and circling around this, around this part of my life, I absolutely love it, mate. And I'm on the crest of a wave and I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going. Cool as a cucumber. I'm the one getting nervous because I've been out for a couple of weeks and you're just sitting there, nice, relaxed, cool, calm. You're smashing it, brother. You're smashing (laughs) it, my mate, as always, bro. (laughs) So do you know the build-up to this first professional fight? Like, when you were training and... when you were training and when you got asked to go to the gym, to the professional gym, did did you go there with knowing that you were going to have an end goal of I will be fighting at this time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, n- not sorry to interrupt you there, mate. Not no, no, the no. actual day. I didn't know that I was going to fight on the day I did, but I knew it was going to be coming you because the was process going. was going so smooth. Mm-hmm. applying everything, the assessments, interviews, it went so smooth. But what I will say is how thorough it is as well, which is reassuring to a fighter. I mean, it, the medicals and everything are second to none, mate. So, you know what I mean? And that, that's really reassuring for a fighter. But I did know, I knew that I was going to be fighting this year because I knew that I was so close after my interview and my assessment. I knew it was just a case of they signed me off and they give me the green light. Once that happens, then the phone can ring and I can get to work. So, um, yeah, and I knew obviously at my age, I'm not going to be a world champion. Um, I'm a realistic guy. I have ambitions. I have goals. I'd love to one day maybe fight for a Northern Area title or a Central Area title. Uh, But to me, I knew what I was getting in for journey, man. I want to go on the road. I've been a road warrior from the start. I mean, if you look at my unlicensed and bare knuckle career, um, it's I've started again the same way against the grain. I was in my first year, I think it was 14 months into it, I fought Will Cairns. Everyone knows Will Cairns. He's had like 900 plus fights. I fought Samuel Godfrey. That man's been in the game 25 years, I think, or over 20 years. Um, I fought cruiserweights. I fought undefeated guys on the road. I fought in Somerset. I fought all over the place. And I think I've very rarely been in a 50-50 fight in my unlicensed career. So, and and you know something, mate? I pulled off quite a few wins, ones that I weren't supposed to as well. So, um, I'm right. proud of every single win and every single fight. See, it, it, to me, it's like you say, you have goals, you have, you have ambitions. Now, you're realistic in that, that term, in that aspect. Now, to me, like, it's not about just winning that world title. It's person, like you said before, personal accomplishments, self-achievement, 100%. self-ambition, like... If, if, if you make it onto the, the zone, obviously, the match room, you, you've made it. You, yeah. you, you've made that. And that is going to change your life, your family's life, and it's going to get you a name. Now, that's making it. That, to me, that's making it. When you, it doesn't matter no amount of, amount of money. Like, if, if you're going to fight on that show, that amount of money is going to be a sum what you ain't going to get every time so th- to me you've made it yeah that is it's not all about winning the it's world the, title. it's the pinnacle it's the it's the exposure it's the experience it's the mm-hmm. occasion the whole magnitude of it all yes. i mean i'm from a small town paddy in lancashire man. and i think i don't know if i'm not mistaken i think it's the only time paddy in lancashire has ever appeared on box rec which mm-hmm. i'm quite proud of and i did say i'd put paddy on the map um, I'm not sure there's ever been a pro boxer from Padium. You know what I mean? So I think this is why as well that, that it's took, um, I've picked up a lot of traction because mm-hmm. uh, the support I get from Padium now, mate, it's just, it's overwhelming, mate. It's overwhelming. You only have to look at my social media posts, the likes and the comments that it gets and the people that message me daily, my sponsors, unbelievable people, mate. Unbelievable people. Couldn't do it without them. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing, mm-hmm. mate. But the journey... It's only just started, and that's what's exciting, mate. It's only just begun. Oh, 100 percent Because I'm not gonna you're not a journeyman because you've only had one fight. But a lot is said like boxing needs fighters like yourself, whether they're your age or younger. Boxing is absolutely needs fighters like yourself. There's not yeah. a lot and not a lot of praise that gets said to these fighters, but that fighters go and who get spotted from the Olympics who have got the medals yeah. and who've done well. 
they can make it through sponsorships. They will get the easy. Not, I'm not going to say it's an easy ride, but they will get yeah. the exposure through, and they yeah. will have the like the not the honor, but they will have a handpicked, not handpicked opponents, but they will have a say in who they are fighting. The easier route. Yes, yeah. and I just I, honestly, just not a lot gets said about the, that type of. Fight that in yeah. boxing. Do you know um, something, Lee? I think that you're right there, mate. From the casual fans' perspective, and no disrespect to the casual fans' perspective, because mm -hmm. casual fans still buy tickets or still purchase pay per views. So, whichever mm -hmm. way you look at it, but the inside of the sport, fellow journeymen, fellow fighters and promoters, the respect is rife, mate. And, and I think that they're the most integral, which means the most necessary part of the sport, are the journeymen. I mean, you look at people like, how would these prospects get brought along and get taught anything? All these journeymen teach them valuable lessons yeah. each fight. I mean, you've got guys like Jamie Quinn, massive shout out to Jamie Quinn, a prolific journeyman. Willie Warburton, I think Will Warburton is now, um, I think he's retired, if I'm not mistaken, but that's a guy I've been studying a lot, along with Curtis Cagano, my coach and manager. I study him a lot because these guys were brilliant at controlling the fight and getting through the rounds, but also teaching the prospect a lesson and entertaining the crowd. So, as you said yourself, mate, they are very, very integral, mate. The most necessary side of the sport. A hundred percent. I remember going to the Dennis Hobson, Hobson show when we were working as part of the media there. And some, you could just tell some of these guys are so tough, man. And some of the punishment and so, some of the shots that they take, man. Like, it, I would love to see some of these people who was calling these, these fighters of that level. Yeah. I would love to see them just do one round. Just one yeah, round with that's them. that's it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because... I don't think they could run a mile, mate. I don't think a lot of these people could even run a mile, mate. So it's just... 100%. But it's one of those things, mate. I think like a lot of things in life, Lee, if you're unhappy inward, you project it outwardly. And I think that's all it is. I put a lot of these people on a pay-no-mind list. I'm pretty sure that in the time coming, I'll get my odd troll. I'll get the odd casual fan that sticks. But it is, it is now literally water off a duck's back. Because I'm on my own trajectory and they're on their own downward one. But obviously, it's most human beings have the capacity to change, mate. But a lot of that is down to just casual fans, mate. And they're just, they're just unhappy, unhappy people. Who do you look up to in boxing? Who do I look up to in boxing? Who do I look up to? I have quite a few of my favourite fighters, people that obviously when I was younger, I admired and I looked up to, like Muhammad Ali. I mean, his personality, his charisma, he was second to none. My world nearly finished with him, yes. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good background, mate. He's a legend and he's all right. It wasn't just what he did in the ring, it was what he did out the ring. You've got your Willie Peps, you've got um, James Braddock. Now we're going right back there. Right no, back. everyone knows the story. James yeah. Braddock, um, he fought Max Bear. Um, yeah. the, all these people, I mean, even some of the bad boys of it, Hector Camacho, some of these people, because they're in their own way, they all had admirable traits and they all brought something to the big screen or something to the table. So, yeah, there, there was many for me, mate. I can't put my finger on just one. There's one fight on time who I would really have loved to have watched fight, Charlie Burley. Now, it, it was a fight on Ray Robinson's time, um, I do believe. And I, let's just say he was quite avoided. Um, An avoided fighter. One hell of a tough man and one hell of a fighter. Um, Charlie Burley. was it? Where was he from, mate? If you bow with us, my brain is not firing. Yeah. Two seconds. He was on one of Bert Sugar's lists of one of the most underrated fighters of all time. Um, yeah, because you know something, mate? Funny enough, I, I love me boxing and I, mm -hmm. I like to think of myself a bit of a historian as well, but I actually, that name is not familiar to me. Uh, I've look, not look, actually heard that I, name. I've got a few like that. I, 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 I've got a few like that, but yeah, I, I just love all the old school boxing, like some of the Benny Lana clips. Yeah, it's just amazing. Some of the footwork, just ridiculous. Um, obviously, I do love the modern day fighter, but I just think back then they were cut from a different cloth. Um, from a different cloth, hundred percent, million percent, hundred percent. I mean, the the times, the times have changed so much now that. It's um, it's way more a business than it is, and the business outweighs yeah. the sporting accolade sense of it. I mm -hmm. think that everybody would agree with that. Um, I think it was Frank Bruno who said it best: "It's show business with blood." 
I yeah, think that was the term. that was the term. But um, yeah, so but the old school fighters, as you say yourself, and we still had some of those throwback fighters in the eighties and nineties and the late 2000s. I mean, we had like look at Mickey Ward and a two row Gatti. I mean, that was special. Kirkley they give us Brown. stuff that'll never ever be forgotten. That stuff cemented in boxing history and folklore. So. 100%, 100%. So, yeah, but, um, that, you are that, right, mate. The old school fight is a different breed, different breed. Just different cloth. I know that output yeah. wasn't that great and that active back then, but the endurance, the toughness, even, even the skill, like skilled defensive fighter, Jack Johnson, like some of the, Jack angles, Johnson. the angles, the science of his defense. I mean, not many men could touch him in his prime. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what? right. Not many men could touch him. This is what I mean. When you watch some of these fighters, it's very deceiving as well. Because it doesn't very. look as easy on the eye. No, Not as aesthetically doesn't. pleasing. But if you look, there's a lot of method behind what they're doing, where your feet are placed, your positioning of your body. It's all very, very intricate. But if you're very. watching it as a casual or you don't know what you're looking for, it does. It just looks a little bit raw, it but does. it is. It is very highly skilled, mate. There's an art. There's, there's a science to the art. I think we could. Science. I think we could talk boxing for hours, Lee. Lad. <laughs> <laughs> I just like I say. I just. I love the sport. I love analysing it. I've seen. I've seen the hundreds, of thousands of fights, like and just just reanalyzing them. My time is really just. I uh, boxing. I just love it. How did you find? Because I know you've got the, the bare knuckle fight at term in tag. I know you've got the unlicensed fight at tag. But how have you been coping with now you're a professional boxer? Professional. Yeah, well, it's a different gravy altogether, mate. Because I'll admit, through my unlicensed and bare knuckle days, I was quite inconsistent for the majority of it. I'll not go into too many details. Um, I had many bouts of depression and there was some bouts of substance misuse. Um, that's all in the history. I'm well out of the woods with that now. But um, yeah, there was times where I had a lot of um, a lot of uh, mental struggles, a lot of adverse points. Uh, there was some great times where I was fit as a fiddle. I was living in the gym, you know. But it was very up and down when I look at it. It was very up and down. Um, whereas in this now, I've been nothing. This is the most consistent I've been because I can. No disrespect to the license for bare knuckle game at all when I say this, but. You cannot cut corners. Mm-hmm. You cannot. If you cut corners with your sleep, your hydration levels, your diet, um, how much you train, how hard you train, you cut corners on any of those aspects and you'll see where it gets you. It won't get you very far. I mean, if I would have cut corners, I trained like a prospect coming up to this debut because I knew if I didn't, I'd be put away. It's as simple as that. You're not going in there with um, with easy opposition. So I've trained consistently. My diet, everything has been on point. I've not missed a beat. I mean, after my fight on Friday, I came home. I didn't touch a drop of alcohol. I didn't, I just, I think I had a takeaway. That was a little bit of um, a treat for myself. And then after that, I was straight back out there, skipping the next morning. I was back in the gym this week and I'm staying on, I'm staying on that wave, mate. That's what people don't understand. Obviously, boxing, (laughs) this is what I try and tell my fighters. Like, you don't just have your schedule of where you are training on this day, this day, this time, this time. You've got to live the lifestyle. You have to live it and breathe it, sleep it and eat it. it, it it's just that. It's, if, the, if you want to progress in this sport or in the combat sport field, you have to live it because there are people out there who are absolutely doing what they are doing and yes, yeah. there's, there's murderers rule man and I mean that in the nicest respect that are some absolute killers coming up man yeah that 100% are some killers in the game so you have to be at the top of your level well said mate 100% that's what I'm saying you can't be um, complacent or naive there's no room in boxing for any of those things all laziness um, I think a good quote my coach put on the other day and it was from I think it was um, Kobe Bryant I'm not too sure it was that that said the quote, and he said, if you have to fight to get you in the gym, then that's a problem. You know what I mean? And it most certainly is in the pro game. You should want to be in that gym. You should want to be in there learning your craft, getting them fundamentals down to a team, making it second nature. Um, For me, nothing less will do, mate. That's why I'm just going to keep smashing it consistent as I can, because you're always learning. And when I was first told that, I thought, what a cliche. But when you actually get into the game, you realise, no, you're learning all the time. There's so many little subtle tricks and tactics and things you can implement and employ into the game. 
um, the, like the journeyman tactics, how to survive the little things, the holding, the spoiling, everything. And you, you think when you've got so many things down to a T or you've learned so many or you're aware of so many different things that that's it, but it's not. And you come to realise that week in, week out, there's always something new. A lot of people don't really understand the true aspects. I mean, the successful people do, but train your body and to train your mind at the same time. Obviously, we're putting yourself through endurance training and strength and conditioning and cardiovascular work. Obviously, the mitt work, sparring, all that is very super hard, hard, hard work. The mentality has to just be right. It's funny you mentioned Kobe Bryant because I've been watching a lot of Michael Jordan uh, just for his absolute pure drive to su succeed in every aspect, even if it was in training to push yourself to that mental torture to get the best out of yourself throughout your whole training and just taking over. How good is it to look over, obviously, because you're in the professional gym now, you train with professional athletes. How good is it to know that when you're, when you're a little bit tired, you take a look to your left, you take a look to your right, and there's, there's people absolutely killing themselves in the same position as you. Does yeah. it elevate you? Does it push you that little extra? It really does. I'm glad you mentioned that, mate. There's, uh, there's a few worthy mentions as well here, the lads in the gym that I train with. Um, the couple of the lads that we train, I mean, it's intense. We do two hours, two hours a day. I travel, I get up in the morning, I'm on a bus by seven o'clock in the morning. I'm travelling two hours to Milner, then I train for two hours and travel back. So I'm doing that five days a week, most weeks. Um, but uh, there's lads in that gym that I bounce off and we all feed off that energy. Um, Stephen Jackson, he's a little super flyweight. Uh, if you put him in on YouTube, you'll see his fights fought on BT Sports. And that lad is a dynamo. The power he has for a super flyweight. But I mean, he's always that lad that when you've done your hill sprints, he wants to do one more or two more. You know what I'm saying? And that then I bounce off that. So then I'm going up that one or two more times. But it's intense and it's absolute. It is. It's grueling, mate. It's grueling. Because you get to a point where the body starts to shut down and it's all on your head then. It's all on you. Can you keep your shape and your form when you're tired? Can you still pop your jab? Can you manage your range? So all these things, you have to have those questions answered. And you have to go past that wall and get through or over it. But yeah. It's absolutely grueling, man. It feels good to know that I can hang with the pros. When I first got there, I noticed pretty quickly that I could, I could hang and that my mentality, I was in the right place, should I say. See, because that's what people see when they look from the outside. They just think, ah, they're just throwing hands. They're just punching. But when you're tired and <laughs> to keep those, like you've just said, your shape, your distance, can you pop your jab out straight? Can you... <laughs> Can you negate? Can you keep your head off centre line? Can you move your yeah. head still? You know yeah. what I mean? It, a lot of that, all the aspects go out the window when you're tired. It, it, you Like you say, you have to be in that right mentality. In that and, right mentality. Yeah, 100%. 100%, mate. 100% spot on. Because like you said, your shape and your form is the hardest thing to keep when you're tired because you're going into survival mode. It's as simple as that. So it's really, really hard to do. But... That's what I'm saying with this pro level, mate. That's why you can't put bonus because, I mean, you could get into amazing shape, go out at the weekend, have a drink and come back and feel like you've gone back six weeks. That's that's the level of consistency. You cannot miss a beat. It is serious work. I, I always say, like, like I said before, you've got to live the lifestyle. If you take that one, two weeks out, you're knackered because that, that man in front of you is always going to be that two weeks in front of you. Two weeks so, ahead, yeah. You, like Mike Tyson used to say, like Floyd Mayweather still does, get those miles in whilst those are asleep. You know what I mean? Get yeah. the hard work done whilst <laughs> you've got the prep. The other guys sleep. Yes, you've just got the prep. It doesn't matter what time of the hours it is. If you can sneak it in, get it in there. How different yeah. was the, like, travelling to the fight, knowing that this was your first pro fight? Because obviously... It, <laughs> People in attendance, the journey there, it's... it's they were all for him, yeah. And, and when when he walked out, the place just erupted. So I was like, yeah, they're all here for him. But um, I'm not going to lie, mate. He's the most nervous I've ever been for a fight. Mm. It was the most nervous I'd ever been for a fight. It was right up there. And I knew within minutes to go, the nerves just kind of evaporated because you know you're in then. 
you're stepping into the fear bubble, you're already there and you kind of just go, boom, right, I've got to do a job. Them nerves just subside and it just turns into a crazy positive charge. And when I walked out, I'm not going to lie, I was a bit like a rabbit in the headlights at first, but once I got a round out of the way, I started to settle in. Obviously, with it being, uh, obviously you travelled, you were away a fighter, with him being a home fighter, um, did did he get a fair shake of the bill? Did it? Did he get a good fair scrap? Was the referee good? Was was everything? Do you know what? It was all spot on, mate. It was spot mm-hmm. on. The referee was an absolute gem. The referee was bang on. Um, if any little indiscretions took place or anything like that, he was on to it. He didn't miss a beat. Uh, yeah, the referee was spot on. I didn't feel like they were trying to put any sort of hurdles in my way or make it unfair. It was absolutely spot on, mate. Uh, the atmosphere was incredible. Um, the fighter himself, absolute props to Leon Willings. Keep an eye out for him, Leon Willings. He's, I think he's from Widnes. I know he's from over Merseyside. Uh, he's 21 in October, which is scary, mate. I mentioned this in the article I've just done in the paper. He's not even found his man strength yet. Yeah. And the kid was really strong. He must walk around over 13 stone, but he's really, wow. really strong kid. But, um, yeah, massive props to him. I think he's got a bright future in boxing. Baby terms 21, he's got such so long ahead 100%, of him. 100% Lee, 100%. So, obviously, you said that you were warming into it. Obviously, after a round, you, you, the nerves went and left. How did you feel you performed in the fight? I performed really well. I think offensively, I left a bit to be desired. I was a bit gun sharp. The backhand wasn't going again, which was a problem for me early to mid unlicensed career I sorted it out it was actually a technical fault believe it or not um, Anthony McGann trainer and uncle of Jack McGann and he also trained Michael Bisbee back in the day wow. took his time out to drop me a quick message and he watched one of my videos and he, he spotted why I was having trouble getting the backhand off and he altered it for me so it was a technical default when my, my back leg was trailing too far dictating how far my right hand could travel so wow. I worked on that constantly I'd go to make a brew and I'd spend 20 minutes 25 minutes working on that and my missus would have to come and find me because I could miss him for half an hour, mate. That's what it, but that's what you've got to be like, obsessed. Yeah. Any things you feel you need to alter or to make better, you've just got to keep working. I mean, after I come off here, I'll be out in the yard skipping, I'll be back in shadow boxing, trying to work on stuff. You've got to constantly be on the beat. Uh, you, you've, like I said before, you've got to put the time in whenever you can. Like you say, even if you're walking to make a brew, if you've got 20, 25 minutes, yeah. put something on. Squeeze it in. Squeeze it in. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to live that life and it's paying off now. Obviously, you're getting some 100%. good reports in the uh, newspaper, the local newspaper. How, how have you found, like, newfound fame, basically? Because, like you said earlier, you feel like a phoenix, you're reborn from the ashes. Everybody, if, if, if people can't say that you're a really changed person now, then I call them ignorant and arrogant because that's that's not your problem, that's their problem. Now, well said. So how are you coping with it? I'm coping with it fantastically, mate, because I had a bit of a following anyway before the pro game, but obviously now since I've gone pro and it's picking up a lot more traction, it's got even bigger, but I'm handling it well because it's all positive. There's nothing negative which... I'm surprised, mate. You know yourself as you're picking up traction, you're getting a bit bigger and you're getting better in your craft or your field, so to speak. Uh, you're doing well for yourself. These people just rear their ugly head. But I've had no trolls. I've had no negativity at all. I'm absolutely loving the local support from Padium to Burnley to Colne and Nelson, which are the surrounding areas in Hamburn and Pendle. I'm getting massive support, mate, and it's huge. The, the local newspaper can't say enough positive things about me. Um, the guy who writes the articles, the sports editor, I've actually become quite friendly with over the last couple of years. He's an absolute top man. Shout out to Dan Black. Does a fantastic job with them articles. And yeah, I'm just loving it, Lee. Absolutely loving it. I, I, like I said, it's great to see a success story. Obviously, I, 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 like I said, I, I feel like we've got quite a bit in common with the lifestyle we've led. I know a lot, I of, people, a lot of people will have stuff and coming through that way but I, I believe it's it's all part of the learning process uh it yeah. does mold you and it, it it does make you into the person who you are and you have to face these trials and tribulations to 100%. get this outcome because if you're not gonna if you're gonna make mistakes let's let's face it they've got to be done when they were young if you're gonna keep doing them when you're an adult then maybe it's 
spot mm-hmm. on, Lee. I just said, funny you mentioned that, brother. I just said this to, uh, it was about two hours ago, I had a conversation about this. And I said, when you're young and temperamental, fair enough. When you're at like, the age we are now, in your 30s, whatever, you should have your act together. Now, I don't mean, oh, by the time you hit 30, you should just automatically switch and change. But you shouldn't still be messing around in the same circles and making those same mistakes because it's shown that you haven't learned from it. Yeah, That's what 100%. it has definitely shown. It's it's um, it's displays it that way. But a lot of people, I can say a lot of people, just they just lose themselves, mate. Working class life's not easy. Day to day, it's a struggle. Not everybody has that mental capacity to be able to flip perceptions and change things. I mean, one thing I will say is when you do get your act together and you pull yourself out of despair and you're in a positive place, you are a positive force for the people around you. And a good example of this is a lot of the people that I have around me or that I've chose to let into my circle are all doing really well. They're either flourishing in the jobs, they're happy in the families, they're content in their own skin. And that's priceless, mate. That is absolutely priceless. It's a beautiful thing when a man rises out of despair because when he gets his act together, let's say he's a positive charge for everybody else around him. Oh, 100%. Because, it, like, like you said, and like I've been through, it, you have to hit those to get to where you are at the moment. And I'm a big believer in if you surround yourself in, with successful people, surround yourself with good people, then good stuff happens. And I just think that's the perfect way as well. It's got this, the circle's got to be small because you know you True. know how life is. It, it, and you're all right. The devil does appear his head when things are going great. It's never yeah. when we're doing bad. But yeah, I'm, I'm a great believer in that myself, my man. Is there any sponsors or anything you would like to give a big shout out to, Seamus? Oh, almost definitely, mate. Hold on. I'm sure I brought a little pad with me, mate. Because I've got <laughs> many people to shout out to, my man. But yeah, I want to first give a shout out to a couple of my friends, Sean McFarlane, my best friend in life. Shout out to him. That guy is an absolute gem. Corey Harrison, Mick Hall, ex professional boxer, top man, good friend of mine, and Danny Christie, the gadget. Shout out to you, fellas. Yes, man, my man. sponsors, King's Roofing, run by Luke Vaughan. Um, Mick Mulcair's gym I want to give that a shout out in Milnrow where I train Gargano Management and my coach Curtis Gargano Upright Scaffolding one of my sponsors run by Declan McKenna they have been absolute gems and have supported me from day one um, I'd also like to give a shout out to David Ridge and Dawn Cryer at Nice Bites in Padium sponsors of mine also shout out to Jay Sykes and Sons John Boy Sykes big shout out brother another sponsor and shout out to all the lads at the gym Stephen Jackson Scott Williams Treyers Ish all the boys leave I done. Big shout out, lads. Honestly, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Honestly, we'll have to do likewise, this again my brother. Well. We'll have to definitely do this again. Uh, I definitely. know you might have some big news that you might be able to share with everybody soon on your social medias. I'm not gonna tell, but I do know what it might be. I'm yeah. fucking well excited for that, my brother. And if it does Top, come man. off. Oh. Thank you, brother. Thank yes, you. This man. is what I mean, mate. This is why I want to be in the smelting pot because these opportunities are going to come my way oh. and I'm going to snatch them with both hands. But it's been an absolute pleasure. I've got to say, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. It's been a good host, mate, spot on. And it's an honour to come on this podcast. I mean that, mate. No, uh, thanks very much for your absolute kind words, my brother. Honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure, honour to have you on, mate. I know it would definitely, definitely have to do this again, my man. Top man, top man. Thank you, my brother. God bless my mate. No worries, my man. Right, people, that is it. That is a wrap. That is number 32 done. Seamus Devlin, hopefully with some good news that he can spread on his social medias very soon. But look out for the other podcasts that's coming up. We yes. will be releasing them on social media as the guests who are coming on soon. So watch out for that. As always, thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to our private sponsor. Peace. God bless, brother.